So the Keepsake 1 and 2 trials have looked at the efficacy and safety of risenkizumab in patients with active psoriatic arthritis. And they're the two phase three trials that will be used for registration of the drug. Um, so the Keepsake 1 trial looked in patients who were DMARD experienced, uh, but biologic naive. Uh, and the Keepsake 2 study also included patients who'd had previous TNF inhibitors. And essentially, both of these trials showed efficacy of risenkizumab in peripheral arthritis, which was the primary outcome for the study, uh, but also in enthesitis, in dactylitis, and as we would expect, given that it's an IL-23 inhibitor, in skin psoriasis as well. Obviously, we uh, are always happy to have additional drugs approved and having IL-23 inhibitors in the form of gazelkumab and potentially now risenkizumab for the treatment of psoriatic arthritis gives us additional options for patients with active PSA. Um, obviously, as a new drug uh, and a new mode of action, these drugs are coming into a relatively crowded marketplace. So we have quite a number of biologic DMARDs available for psoriatic arthritis, Although it's clear there is still an unmet need, there are still a, a high, relatively high proportion of patients who, uh, whose disease is not fully controlled and would benefit from additional treatment. So I think the IL-23 inhibitors, uh, including risenkizumab, gives us another option for treatment. I think they're clearly particularly good for skin disease. We've seen that in the dermatology trials. So I think for patients with psoriatic arthritis and significant skin disease, these are gonna be an important option. Um, there's still a question about whether they will be efficacious in axial disease. Um, so at the moment, uh, I wouldn't use them in patients with axial disease, but I think for patients with severe skin disease, they're probably a reasonable option in psoriatic arthritis. We have seen uh, in the IL-23 studies that as a mode of action, it does seem to be a slightly slower onset of response. So I maybe would be less likely to pick this drug in patients with very active, uh, severe disease who need a quicker fix, um, so to speak. But I think we do see at reasonable levels of response at sort of week 24 onwards. Uh, and these drugs generally are quite well tolerated as well. So I think in terms of next steps, obviously, uh, this gives us data on kind of initial efficacy uh, in a mixed population. So DMOD uh, failure patients, uh, but some biologic naive, some biologic experienced. Um, I think it would be useful to have more studies, uh, particularly in those who have previously failed a TNF inhibitor, because that's a large cohort of our patients now and obviously a very important unmet need. Um, it would be really interesting to start looking at how we choose biologics for different patients and really trying to optimise uh, getting the right drug to the right patient. So thinking about the skin disease, about comorbidities, about axial involvement and making sure that we're considering the efficacy in those different domains as we select treatment. And then I think the other question really for IL-23 is moving forward is whether they are going to be efficacious for axial PSA. So we've got good, good evidence of efficacy for IL-23 in skin, in peripheral joints, in enthesitis and in dactylitis. Uh, but we've seen a negative trial in an ankylosing spondylitis population. However, in contrast, we've got some data from the gazelkumab studies, which showed that patients who had axial involvement confirmed by their physician and by some imaging showed a very significant improvement in BASDI scores uh, during the peripheral arthritis PSA trials. So there's now a question about whether this could be effective for axial psoriatic arthritis uh, and that may be a difference between axial PSA and a true ankylosing spondylitis population. I think that's still a question. Uh, I personally wouldn't choose an IL-23 inhibitor for a patient with significant axial disease at the moment because I don't think there's enough data. And the BASDI is obviously not a specific measure of spinal disease. It will pick up improvement in other domains as well. But I think it's a fascinating question for the future and may also help us learn more about the pathology of the disease, in particular if the responses are different in AS compared to axial PSA because obviously there are significant overlaps there, but we do see some differences in terms of genetics and imaging, uh, and this may be uh, one of those key differences.